down through time, men have combined certain words. Trust. They have coupled terms which have very polarized interpretations. Apparently in an effort uh, to create the concept of a polarized existence, a universe of opposing processes. Later on, with the rise of philosophical systems, <laughs> thinkers tried to spin webs between these poles to create common grounds between opposites and to bind so-called contraries into some strong pattern of harmonies. Possibly the most familiar of these polarization couplets is made up of the words heaven and earth. And because we live under a pattern of philosophy, of religion, of science, of law, of ethics, all more or less based upon this polarized concept, it seems it might be interesting and profitable to try to understand it more completely. Our word heaven meant to the ancients essentially the vault of the sky. And his polarization was to consider the sky as the positive pole of existence and the earth as the negative. The earth was beneath his feet, the sky was above his head. The earth was his immediate home, and gradually the sky became the abode of his gods. Our very ancient ancestors believed that the gods walked upon the earth with men. Deities were only tribal spirits. Divinities like men had their appetites and their attitudes. The Greeks gave Olympus as the abode of their gods. The Hindus assigned Miru to the same uh, purpose. But the gods simply dwelt upon the high places of the earth. It was not until philosophy and mysticism unfolded to a considerable degree or perhaps more realistically, somebody started climbing mountains. That this theory lost caste. Then it was assumed that these deities departed into the sky, where they had their proper habitations and abodes. Here, from some mysterious region beyond human ken, they continued to administer the destinies of their creations. So men gradually came to look up toward the sky in worship, seeing in the heavens the mysterious shadows of their gods. The elementals diffusion which we see around us, storms, earthquakes, winds, clouds, lightning, all of these to some measure uh, seem to strengthen our ancestors' veneration for the region above. It was the home of the phoenix and the thunderbird. It was the place where the ancient ones gathered in solemn conclave to administer the responsibilities of their human children. By the degrees, heaven took on another meaning also. Heaven became an emblem of the very nature and body of a living being. Heaven became the all-enclosing 
body of God. Heaven became synonymous with deity, and we find this condition in China. Heaven was the first of all bodies and forms. It was the vast egg from which came forth the primordial ancestors of all that live. Therefore, heaven was a kind of being in itself. As the Egyptians pointed out, it was a kind of great arched body with its feet upon the earth, bent over forward, with its hands upon the earth, forming out of this the arch of the sky. And this body of the deity was covered with brilliant colored jewels, which were the stars. This heaven arched over the earth, brooded over it, became the eternal parent of earth. Earth, again, came to be regarded as born from heaven. And heaven took upon itself an androgen quality. Heaven originally included earth, contained earth within it. Heaven was male-female. And when within its own nature it divided, it became polarized as heaven and earth. And even today in Eastern metaphysics, earth is a part of heaven, and there is no essential difference between superiors and inferiors. There is not a separate substance for earth or a separate substance for, for heaven. Each is a condition of the other. And this is where men began to spin the webs to tie the opposites together, that they were only states and aspects of the same thing. In all philosophies and mythologies, therefore, nearly all peoples begin their thinking with the concept of an all-brooding, ever-present heaven, a heaven that encloses and surrounds and permeates, a heaven which is of its own nature both time and eternity, but in its heavenly aspect, is eternity. Eternity in sense of duration of time, eternity in sense of extension of direction, eternal in the f sense also that it never began and can never end, and all beginnings and all endings occur within heaven. Many of our early forebears tried to struggle with the problem of first cause. How did it all start? Who is responsible for this tangled thread of circumstance that we call existence? Most of these philosophic peoples, however, finally came to the conclusion that heaven was not only their refuge, but their best answer. That this eternal quality the infinite superior was simply timeless. Plato fell back upon this concept, and so did most of the Eastern philosophers. There was no use questioning heaven. Heaven never answered. If there was any discussion at all, it would be heaven that would do the questioning, not man. Heaven contain locked within it all secrets of existence. Men live not only under the bow of heaven, but under the will of heaven. This will cannot be explained. It can only be accepted. Wisdom, therefore, among the ancient Chinese was essentially man's power to accept heaven. And wisdom as a method of learning was simply the ability of the individual to demonstrate to himself that in all things heaven, knew, heaven knows best. Finally accepting this, that the edicts of heaven 
are beyond the complaints of mortals. But the way of heaven is the only way. The human mind relieved itself of a great many uncertainties and could settle down to the more practical problems of taking care of man's own mundane affairs. So heaven became, in a sense, the symbol not only of life, eternal, but truth, inevitable. Heaven was truth because there was no recourse beyond it. Truth as we know it is only a term. It is a term that we have created to signify the fact of a thing, the reality of it, its complete explanation or exposition. That attitude which is without error is said to be truthful. Truth as, as isolated from heaven, man could never hope to grasp. But man accepting heaven accepted it as truth, creating within himself the attitude that no matter how you look at anything, you cannot escape from the will of heaven. Therefore, under all conditions, the will of heaven has to be the measuring stick. Beyond it, we cannot go. Against it, we cannot strive successfully. Heaven, therefore, also became the proper emblem of regulation. The Egyptians saw in the orderly progression of these planets and the stars uh, and the seasons a perfect rulership a revelation of the immutability of natural law. Men today can see far more when they turn their attention to heaven than the ancient Egyptians could. But their increased power to explore heaven has never in any way invalidated the basic Egyptian concept. We can explore further but we can discover nothing which justifies us in assuming that heaven is an error in anything. Nor can we find any substantial proof that heaven is non-intelligent, that heaven is lifeless, that heaven is only the vast dial of a machine. This we cannot prove. We would like to not because it would make any particular difference in space, but because it would give a great deal of exhilaration to our own egos. We resent even the rulership of heaven. We resent the fact that we cannot control the sky and the stars. Heaven, however, as the Chinese pointed out, is not particularly concerned with that. Heaven continues on its way, fulfilling itself, being itself, sustaining itself forever. It is man who must adjust, must bring heaven finally into his own heart and soul as something to be accepted. Because heaven was the superior part of creation, Man gradually came to liken it to the concept of spirit. Man recognized a certain division within himself of an invisible and a visible nature. His visible nature seemed to associate with the earth. It was composed of the same general substances as the elements that make up earth. But man sensed within himself something that was not earth, something that was invisible, something that he could not examine, could not explore. This something bestowed life upon him, but he could never interrogate it. He could never demand that it reveal its secret. All man could do was accept life, accept the gift of existence, of consciousness of animation, and then proceed to use these benefits 
according to his own insight. Because man sent spirit or life to be the greater part of himself, he associated it gradually by the law of analogy with heaven. Heaven became the symbol of spirit, earth of matter. Heaven became the symbol, therefore, of eternal life, earth of eternal death. Not because the earth was dead, but simply by contrast, by relativity, by interpretation, it seemed to be the negative pole of the great life polarities. If heaven corresponded to spirit, it was therefore the mysterious source of the life of all things. And many ancient peoples were quite convinced that the one life of the heavens or of the universe animated all creatures, and therefore that in life they are one, but in body and form they are divided. The Chinese, thinking of this problem, realized that in the course of time, man and other factors of existence seem to lock in an endless conflict with life itself. Man declares war against heaven. Nature seems to impede the ways of heaven, even as body, in one way or another, inhibits consciousness. So the uh, great war that was fought in space was the war between spirit and matter. And spirit and matter is another name for heaven and earth. All things material obscured the ways of spirit. Therefore, matter became a symbol of error, of falseness, of darkness. And because the earth was the graveyard of all that existed, became the symbol of death. Heaven was life, earth was death. Heaven was spirit, earth was matter. Man, as a spirit, is ever fighting against death as matter. He is struggling desperately to escape from the limitations which bind him away from universality. Man wants to be everything, everywhere, always. Matter tells him that he can be something, somewhere, for a little while. And that uh, is an aggravating restriction upon freedom of expression. So man rebels against this also, and, and eternally. Atheism is a rebellion against this. All forms of unbelief, all turning away from the ancient paths of things, do not, these do not bear witness to the failure of heaven but to the impatience of man. Man, striving through the ages, found that he could not storm the gates of heaven. He found that he could not conquer this, this mysterious invisible in which he existed. Consequently, he changed his tactics slightly at least and sought in some way uh, to create friendship with that over which he could not achieve victory. Systems of learning were brought into manifestation. Religions were fashioned in order to bring man into, a, into an harmonious relation with the great opposing power, heaven itself. Now in what way did heaven oppose man? Actually, it did not. Heaven never opposed anything. But the, uh, the opposition that man sensed was the silence of heaven. This silence was like a wall. And the fact that heaven did not reveal itself was this unkind act that man resented. <laughs> 
Man questioning heaven received no answer, and therefore he regarded heaven as an enemy. It never occurred to him that his own questions were improper. So heaven became, in a sense, this unknown which had to be conquered. Heaven was the unknown. Earth was the known. The earth could be conquered, theoretically at least. But men conquering the earth were conquered by heaven. For heaven had ordained life and death, and from these no man could escape. Philosophy and religion sought to bring man into a more benevolent relationship with heaven. Religion placed God in heaven as a personification of eternity, as a symbol of the all-creating, the all-pervading power at the source of life. God could be figured or symboled in a variety of ways, but always the, the being that dwelt in heaven was the personification of the inevitable will of heaven. Men, by obeying heaven, therefore, could escape from the miseries and sorrows which arose from rebellion. The ancient legends mostly include some outstanding example of rebellion, as in the case of Lucifer, who was cast down from heaven for rebelling against the inevitable power. Man was warned of the danger to re of rebellion. Well, this went along fairly well until another element was introduced. But after men had created the concept of a father in heaven, they then tried desperately to interpret the will of that father. They wanted to, in some way, create a code which would be the code of heaven. And they did create great moral codes and great ethical systems. And whereas, in some instances, the philosophic ones remain comparatively simple and morally consistent, many of the, the, of the theological ones went too far. They not only established God, but they tried to do God's thinking for him, and this was a mistake. This mistake divided the faiths of men into more than 72 different basic interpretations of deity. These interpretations of deity were never accepted or regarded as interpretations. Religion developed a peculiar instrument called revelation, by means of which it assumed and affirmed that it was capable of possessing an inward knowledge of the realities of existence, and that religion could stand as the representative of deity. In this case, we began to have war in heaven. We found that different peoples began to overlook heaven itself as the great unity. And instead of basing their religions upon this vast unity, they began to break it up. Now, heaven cannot be broken up. The only thing that man can do is to break up his own thinking against it. It is like some vast rock, and everything that strikes it like an ocean wave is broken by the rock. So man broke up his own beliefs, but heaven remained unchanged. Man created sectarianism, which was not justified by the example of heaven. Interpretation was justified. 
for men must interpret the eternal in terms of their own needs. But dogmatic, despotic sectarianism was not justified. For no man, because of his interpretation, had a right to criticize or condemn the interpretation of another man. Heaven was great enough to include all interpretation. And the only way we could truly honor deity would be to suspect, at least, that deity was the sum of the dreams and convictions of all living things, and that deity was vast enough, com uh, complete enough, uh, to receive veneration in any conceivable form without this veneration uh, being misguided or in any way objectionable. So in breaking up man's religious instinct, we began to lose the sense of the integrity of heaven. We began to have individuals in two armies drawn up for battle, each asking the help of heaven and each expecting to receive it. We, have, we had heaven called upon to afflict our neighbor, to destroy our enemy. And little by little, uh, heaven descended into a despotism by interpretation, just as so often good governments among men are corrupted by selfishness. As a result of this situation, the personifications which men fashioned took precedence over the principles upon which they were based. The great principle was heaven, but man has never fashioned a deity as universal as the original concept. Perhaps we are coming a little nearer to this hoped-for state today, because as we explore further into the scientific mysteries of life, the more we are forced to recognize the universality of universal processes. We are forced to recognize that this universe was not the product of, shall we say, sectarian creation. It was the product of one tremendous, all-knowing principle, producing all things according to a wisdom far greater than our own, which even after the hundreds of thousands of years of man's mental existence, he has never been able to really understand. So heaven, to the wise, to the mystic, to the philosopher, to the non-sectarian thinker, remains as it always was, uh, the complete symbol of the complete universal process, the symbol of heaven and earth undivided, the symbol of the total unities of existence. Well, actually, earth, as we think of it today, and referred to it sometimes in the old books as the footstool of the Almighty. The earth is really not the thing that is supporting us under our feet. The ancients were fully aware of the fact that if you went far enough down, you were going to get back into space again. That this earth is simply suspended within the vast structure of space itself. There is just as much space under our feet as there is over our heads. There is also space extending around us and space within us. We are like bubbles floating in space. And this little planet simply is a convenient place to rest our feet for a moment in our journey through time and space. Earth, consequently, represents a condition. Earth is something that arose in space along with countless other manifesting worlds. Space produces out of itself innumerable living things that are time-controlled and place-ridden. <clears throat> 
Thus it would seem that heaven is always creating earth. Heaven is always causing a condition the exact opposite of itself to appear within itself. For as surely as heaven is eternal, earth is temporal. As surely as heaven is the most alive of all things, earth is the least alive, as far as we can understand these matters. As surely as heaven is everywhere, earth is in one place only. As surely as heaven will go on forever, so surely earth will perish. The great question as to why earth was fashioned out of space will probably not be answered for a long time. Again, we come back to the inevitable acceptances. The creation of earth, or earths, or worlds, is an expression of the will of heaven. Beyond this will, we cannot go. But we have one point that is always a little bit helpful. Earth produces the necessary elements for the individualization of life. Therefore, life exists not only universally in space, but it is locked into evolving creatures in the element of earth. Earth, some way, captures the life of heaven, as in a vessel. And so it was represented in ancient times. It is the cup or the container, the crater, which receives into itself the power of heaven. It had occurred to the Chinese, who were rather wise in many things, that if heaven had not produced earth, man could not have existed. And if man had not existed, there would be nothing to honor heaven. Now this is a kind of acute thought, because it seems to tell us the main point, namely that it is through embodiment, individualization, and personalization that a kind of consciousness is created in man which achieves self-awareness, and ultimately space, time, consciousness, spirit awareness. Heaven actually, as far as our thinking is concerned, could not exist without us. Without us, heaven would simply be this vast expanse of eternal processes. But man takes hold of this concept, concept and dramatizes it. He romanticizes it. And not only that, but he begins to create this web of analogies to bind himself to this thing. It is man who has made heaven instructive. It is man that, ha it is man that has caused the great philosophies of space to come into existence. Perhaps on another planet, something else beside man is doing the same thing. But for us, all of our very questing after reality is the result of the union in us of heaven and earth. The result of the mingling or marriage of the sun and moon, as the alchemists call it the moon being the ancient mad mother of the earth. And as the sun represents the great light and the moon the reflected light, we find in man the sun represents spirit, the body itself, the earth, represents body, and the moon represents soul. And the ancient soul represented the psyche. And, of course, we all know that when the soul gets sick, we call it lunacy. We're deriving it from the sickness of the moon or the sickness of the soul. In the 
development, therefore, of man, we can go back to the Chinese concept of ancestor worship. In China, the primordial ancestor of all that exists is heaven. All things exist only as the children of heaven. Shanti, imperial heaven, is therefore the complete, eternal, and inevitable sovereign. All China, which is the Middle Empire, which means the place of the reasonable, is des descended from imperial heaven. Every living thing just traces, therefore, its ancestry to heaven in China just as surely as in the Western thinking we're inclined to trace our family tree back to Adam and Eve. We trace ours back to the earth. They trace theirs back to the sky. Shanti, imperial heaven, was the absolute article. No one knows how heaven came into being. No one can estimate how long the reign of heaven will continue. Creations disappear periodically, but they simply go to sleep in the eternal power. And when worlds come into manifestation again, these worlds in the course of time once more recognize heaven. For of all things, heaven alone is worthy of absolute veneration. The Chinese say that it is worthy of eternal veneration because locked in it, in some mysterious way, is the answer to the one question. The question which has been asked since the dawn of time, what is truth? Truth is locked in the soul of heaven. Little fragments of it appear in the manifestation of deity, in all the processes of creation. But the total truth belongs to heaven alone. And heaven sits enthroned upon the phoenix throne, and before his eyes are the fringes of his bonnet. And these fringes are like the veils before the face of God, which no man has lifted. The truth is forever veiled. And the veil is the sky, the mysterious blue drapery of the temple of Isis at Sais, the veil that no mortal will ever uh, open. So that uh, Shanti is the, uh, the ancestor. All of the mortal emperors, beginning with Fuhi, are descended from imperial heaven. Imperial heaven sent its son to become its regent over men in the Chinese concept. And we have the same essentially in our own religious thinking. And this son of heaven was the first emperor at the beginning of the imperial line. And in China, all of the emperors were the agents of heaven. They were accountable to heaven. And the uh, Chinese empire was a microcosm, or a miniature of heaven. And just as the universe was fashioned from the mingling of five elements, so surely China was an empire of five provinces. Every element that was present in the universal procedure was captured in the microcosm of the Middle Kingdom. Around the world of China was drawn the line which was the circumference of existence. China recognized no land outside of its own. But within its own area, it was like an alchemical bottle within which were all the elements and materials of the cosmic processes. China believed this, and believed that it was truly the symbol of heaven.
The primary formation of this symbol was therefore the, the establishment of the man-likeness of heaven. And of course, the primordial man-likeness was the emperor. And the emperor was the celestial Adam. The emperor was the archetype, the anthropos, or the overman, from whom all other forms of mortals were derived. The emperor was the patriarch, the founder of the line, uh, the first of all ancestors on earth, and himself the son of heaven. And on the earth, therefore, men became, in a sense, all participants in the power of the emperor. All men have the same appearance of body and member, having five extremities, like the five provinces of China. Consequently, the human being became another type of microcosm, the little empire. And in man, all of the processes by which heaven sustained earth were reproduced in miniature. To study China was to study man. To study man was to study China. And all of their arts and sciences were built upon this interrelationship. Confucius made a great deal of the magic interplay of heaven and earth. Heaven the forever bestowing, earth the forever receiving. Man, by his very nature, became the ever-receiving, because with all other creatures he was sustained by the ever-bestowing. Being that which must forever receive into itself, man had the possibility of a variety of receptivities. It was not simply necessary for him to inhale and receive the life of the air, or stand out in the sun and receive the light of heaven on the crown of his head. There was more to it than this. Man had to perfect his own receptivity. This is something we do not understand at all in the West, because we have tried so hard to play heaven that we have forgotten that it is necessary for us to be earth. This does not mean that there is no heaven in us, for it is the heaven in us that permits us to play earth. But man, by his very nature, is not and cannot be complete. Man is a spark, heaven is the flame from which all the sparks came. Man is a pot, heaven is all. The part can never conquer all. But by the very nature of this relationship, the part can never be divided from the all, except by an act of itself, self-division, self-isolation. Confucius then uh, explained uh, that a series of proprieties had to be set up between heaven and earth. And Confucius took the attitude that earth itself was the perfect model of deportment. In other words, all the deportment of men toward heaven was derived from man's investigation, contemplation, and interpretation of the processes of earth. By this, of course, the ancient Chinese used a term for which we now use the word nature. In other words, nature was the handmaiden of heaven. Nature was the perfect responding agent. When the sun shone upon the earth, nature rose to meet the sun. Nature reacted instantly to every mood of heaven, whether it be the motions of stars and our calculations in nativities, all the various cosmic energies thrilling through space. According to the Chinese, the moment heaven struck the great gong, heaven having struck 
earth echoed the tone. There was never a break. There was never an inconsistency. There was never any resistance or rebellion by earth. Earth simply responded. Earth, as the great mother, was the eternal consort of heaven as the eternal parent. So the union of heaven and earth has always been fruitful, even as the union of spirit and body has always been fruitful. The union of spirit and body produced mind. The union of heaven and earth produced man. Man was the creature, therefore, capable of having within his own nature the unfoldment of the principle of mind. And the great opposite, the great polarity, was finally reconciled in the nature and structure of man himself. Man had a peculiar and unique place in all this, according to Mencius. Man did not know all of heaven, but he sensed within himself something of the life of heaven. Man did not know all of earth, but he lived upon earth, and earth was in his very flesh. Consequently, man, in a strange way, knew something of heaven and earth. He knew something of the life within him and the body around him. He knew something, or intuited something, of the laws of heaven. And he experienced the strange patterns of the seasons and processes of earth. He was the child of these polarities. And in man, according to the Chinese, these great polarities were reconciled. It was man himself who created with his thinking the polarities. And it was man himself who had to reconcile, by better thinking, the polarities which he had created. For in the vast processes of universal existence, if man did not exist, time, space, world, heaven, earth, in their own natures would go on just the same. But man created them by interpretation. And the interpretations which he gave them set up psychic processes within himself. And as man cannot fulfill his own destiny, torn between two allegiances, as uh, Gator so well points out, that there are two souls within our breasts, one to heaven aspires and the other in the earth suspires. There is always this struggle in us, the struggle toward inertia, which is earth, the study, and the struggle toward action or activity, which is heaven. One day inertia wins, another day activity wins. At the present process of living, inertia wins during working hours and activity when we're enjoying ourselves. But in any event, this struggle goes on. A man has to reconcile this struggle in himself. He has to realize, therefore, that there is actually no struggle except his own attitude about it. There has never been a war between heaven and earth, actually. There cannot be. Because heaven and earth are merely the expressions of one power in its infinite manifestation. There has never been a moment when earth rebelled against heaven. Rebellion arises not in earth, but in mind. Consequently, man having created within his own nature, by the processes of his own evolving uh, being, the power to think, which is a power bestowed by heaven, but a power also invested in earth, a power in which the earth factor comes to immediate attention. Uh, Confucius points out that man, by his sight processes, has two forms of vision. 
One form of vision is to see the things of the world, the earth, the kingdoms of earth. And in seeing these, they are very real and immediate to him. He has another in internal kind of vision for the contemplation of heaven. This vision is a sort of meditation process. But what man experiences in this meditation is like a dream. It is something he senses, but it has no tangibilities. Therefore, in his experience with his present sensory balance, as Buddha tells us, he has inevitably given more sense of reality to earth than he has to heaven. He has found the great mother more sympathetic than the eternal father. He has learned also that by some strange process, he seems to be able to conquer the earth, but he cannot conquer heaven. The earth becomes an instrument for the immediate fulfillment of desires, and heaven the object of an ultimate desire, which man does not understand. In the course of time, materialism thus came into existence due to the proximity of material things and the remoteness of spiritual things. This was again part of the symbolism of the sun and moon, in which the moon appears to be nearer, appears to be brighter at night at least, because it is nearer, but is only shining with the reflected light of the sun, but this we do not realize. Materiality, consequently, is man accepting the visible part of heaven and rejecting the invisible part. Perhaps not really entirely rejecting it, but utterly confused by it. It is very hard for a person to value something that he cannot see as much as he values something that he can see. It is hard for him to believe that wisdom, which he can hardly calculate, is more advantageous than a good bank account which he can examine every day. Thus, through his sensory perceptions, through his attachment, his desires, his thoughts, his ambitions, he has become more and more bound to earth. And what we call a materialist is simply a person who has found earth easier to understand than heaven, and finds the search for heaven more arduous uh, than seems to be practical. We are in the world aware that certain processes will produce immediate results. When we turn to heaven, we are not so sure, and we have observed too long and too often the misfortunes of righteous men. This means, then, uh, that we have gradually substituted the reflection for the reality. We have accepted earth as something real and heaven as something unreal. Now, the only difficulty with this new acceptance pattern is that it thus does not operate. As soon as we become earth-bound, and a soul which is focused upon earth is earth-bound, whether alive or dead. Once we have become earth-bound, uh, we begin to sense another point that is interesting. The Chinese were well aware of this, namely that concentrating our attention upon the earth, we make a discovery. In terms of potential, man is greater than earth. Thus man can conquer earth. Man can have dominion over earth because earth cannot really fight back 
Earth is receptive because it is its rule and its law, and it's inevitable to be receptive. Therefore, it must also be receptive of the tyrannies of men. Man discovering that he can mold earth into almost any pattern that he desires. And without any real insight into the rules governing life, the rules of heaven, inevitably gets himself into complex situations. Following only his own judgment, which is a confusion of heaven and earth ill-digested within himself, he permits ambition desires, attitudes, and appetites uh, to control his conduct in relation to earth or to nature. He tries in every way that he can to create in nature the fulfillment of his own desire. This seems to him the only thing that he can do. It does not seem very reasonable for him to attempt to build a corporation in space. But he can get some choice land here and go to work. Man, therefore, having made his own decision and choosing to cast his lot with the earth rather than with heaven, by so doing must take on the other negative aspects of earth he must take on one of the inevitable facts of earth, namely constant mutation. The earth is completely impermanent. It is impermanent not only in the long-range sense, but it is impermanent like the body of man is impermanent. We think of man living 70, 80, 90 years. Actually, there is not a cell in man's body that lives a tenth of that time. Actually, every day we are in a case or a state of mutation. Every day the inner structure of ourselves is changing, and our own death rate is greater than that of the human population of the earth. Everything is impermanent. The very processes of earth have their exhaustions. The wealth of the earth has its exhaustion. We are now worried about population explosion because earth is limited. And we are beginning to think more and more of how we are going to meet the demands of more place in space. The only thing we can think of is to try to mine space for food to discover, if we can, the vitalities and energies in the air around us, and perhaps chain them to the perpetuation of our physical kind. The only other possibility is to reach out in space for another place, and another planet, hoping to find it either unpopulated or unable to defend itself. Then we will find a new opportunity new frontiers as we did a hundred years ago within the area of our own earth. But earth has its limitations. Man has his limitations. And all these great plans and counterplots that men create all tumble down to nothing. And that to sit on it is the symbol of the ultimate fulfillment of life is a mistake. Because if you do not get off of the cushion, the next man who wants it will have you carried away. You will not remain too long. The Chinese and the Hindus also decided that there was only one way of measuring value in space. And that value has something to do with permanence. Now, permanence in philosophy and in religion is not a little rock balancing forever in eternity in the same spot. Permanence is not a thing staying the same forever. 
for there is only one thing that can stay the same forever, and that is heaven. Because there is nothing that heaven is not. And heaven can never be less than itself. So there, heaven cannot change. But all other things do change. And they change in the process of becoming like or unlike heaven. Things that grow become more like heaven by changing. Things that regress become less like heaven by changing. But everything changes. Heaven is eternal, but it is also eternal motion, eternal life, eternal unfoldment, eternal becoming. The greatest permanence, therefore, is the individual being able to enter the systematic condition of forever becoming. This is his greatest possibility of permanence. And this possibility is bound to heaven and not to the earth. Out of the idea, then, of heaven, we now have heaven as origin and heaven as ultimate, and earth as a little place between these two things. Earth is like maturity, suspended between childhood and old age. Earth is like that moment of success suspended between the struggle to gain and the inevitable circumstance of loss. Earth is the momentary gratification, inevitably leading to pain, to sorrow, to loss, dissatisfaction, and the final necessity to relinquish all that has been achieved. The Chinese, consequently, uh, believed that Man must choose. He must choose by his own nature between heaven and earth. He must choose to follow heaven. And in order to follow heaven, he cannot directly imitate heaven. The emperor of China might be the greatest man on earth, according to Chinese thinking at least, and he might have the most splendid symbols of temporal authority conceivable. But in the great ceremony of the fortunate New Year, the emperor, when he approached his own father, imperial heaven, had to cast off all his raiment of glory and come as a humble being in a plain white robe. In the same way, when the high priest of Israel entered into the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle or the temple, he could not wear his robes of glory. He had to come in in a plain white robe as the symbol of humility. Man cannot achieve the state of heaven by copying the glory of the infinite. Man also is subservient to heaven. But there is a little difference between man and earth, because earth is heaven's queen. Earth, in a certain sense, is in eternal partnership with heaven. Heaven ordained earth and gave it its powers, bestowed upon it the authorities which it possesses. And in the union of these two, all fruitfulness came into existence. But man is not exactly a servant. Man is not some kind of a worm crawling on the earth who must forever humiliate himself. Heaven does not want man to debase himself. For in so doing, he debases heaven within him. Heaven does not want man to be arrogant, for all arrogance is rebellion against heaven, whether heaven in the eternal or heaven in man himself. The Chinese believe that man was the son of heaven and earth. Therefore, that his relationships to his parents were governed by the infinite proprieties 
and the great proprietors which, con which regulated the conduct of China were philosophically and mystically interpreted to be the proper proprieties by which man would adjust himself to the universal pattern to which he belonged. The uh, good book that we know tells us to honor the father and mother. This was the will of heaven also in China. To honor the father, not only the physical parent who is the symbol of heaven, but the eternal parent who is heaven. Man must therefore honor heaven and earth. And in honoring heaven and earth, he is honoring his father and his mother. And according to Chinese psychology, when he honors his father and mother, he honors heaven and earth. For the lesser becomes the symbol of the greater. And the great pattern of analogies cannot be violated anywhere, on any level, without endangering the validity of the entire pattern so far as man's conscious life is concerned. The proprietors, therefore, regulate all of the relationships by means of which man must approach heaven. Confucius was not what we would term a devout man. I think a great many Confucian scholars have missed, however, that under the moral and ethical system of Confucianism, there is actually the shadow of the great Chinese theology. Confucius honored of all things and above all things the I Ching, the great classic of changes, which was nothing more or less than an involved and complicated Kabbalistic exposition of the various unions of heaven and earth. Therefore, in man's relationship with these polarities, these problems that arise, he is represented in the Chinese concept as a youth of filial proprieties and filial devotions uh, when he takes certain attitudes towards both heaven and earth. In the presence of heaven, he must always be respectful. In the presence of earth, he must always be considerate. In the presence of earth, he must forever consider. For it is through the consideration of earth that man comes to understand nature. It is only when very quietly, and like a good child, he sits at the knee of his great mother and listens to the instruction of the ages that he begins his life well. It is only through becoming inwardly aware of all the principles and operations and processes of nature that man actually pays respect to the great mother. It is the great mother who teaches him. She is the beginning of the university. She is life with its great pattern of experiences. And no matter how old the son becomes, he will never be as old as his mother. No matter how quickly he gets to the top of Fool's Mountain, no matter how brilliantly his adolescence seems to be, he must ultimately bow his head again and return to the wisdom of the mother because she represents all of the acceptances which make up the life of the wise. Nature is forever revealing the will of heaven. Nature is forever obedient to the will of heaven. And nature, in every mood and action, is strangely true, fanatically true, to the spiritual power of God.
Thus, in this we have the deportment, which according to Confucius was the relationship of family, father, mother, son, or father, mother, daughter. This great unity. Man must never profane the mother, must never fail to provide for her, must never under any conditions leave her open to need. At the same time, he must give reverence to the father. He must always recognize the father as the leader. When the man is seventy and the father is ninety, the duties of filial piety are not changed. These duties are based not upon human relationships, but are merely the human interpretation of the soul's relationship with space. Though in the material sense of the word, where parents are not always as wise as heaven and earth, where in many cases children have not too much to respect their parents for, it is not easy, perhaps, to fulfill the old Chinese requirement as far as filial relationships are concerned. But the symbolism is the important thing. For it is the symbol that binds man's conduct to the cosmos. If man is forever thoughtful of the earth, forever kind to it, it also means that he is harmless to all these creatures that, like himself, are the children of the same mother. All peoples are the children of the great mother. She will defend them, and she does defend them, without partiality to the end. She has no favorite sons. She has no outcasts. She turns away from none. The rain falls upon the just and the unjust. All things in nature are absolutely fair, operating upon a simple merit system. Man must learn this. For when he breaks this rule, as the old Chinese moral code is, he breaks the heart of his mother. And where he does these things, it is not good for him. The mother of Mencius is one of the immortals of Chinese literature and Chinese history because she is the one who made the three steps to protect her son. These three steps were three changes of residence in order that the boy might be removed from a place of bad influences or inferior influences. The mother being constantly mindful of the need to protect her son from wrong association. The same thought occurs in the proprieties. The three steps of the great mother are very simple. To provide all that lives with the materials of existence. To provide all that lives with means of unfolding character and integrity, and instilling by example into all that lives respect and affection for God. These are the contributions that the mother makes to the life of the child. Now as the Confucian code turns to heaven, how shall heaven be honored? One is that no man shall ever, under any condition, humiliate his father. He shall never, behind his father's back, criticize him or condemn him. Furthermore, whether his father is right or not, the duties of filial piety require that he be respectful, that he be thoughtful, and though he be many times injured, 
he must not injure in return. This is no more than the Sermon on the Mount, but it is applied a little differently. Because now it does not apply merely to the earthly father, but to heaven. To the Chinese, the greatest of all filial uh, sins, we might say, would be to deny the father. To deny that a certain parent is your father is to be cast off utterly into oblivion. To deny the eternal father is therefore to deprive oneself of a tremendous internal strength, which we are beginning to sense now, although we didn't realize this a few years ago. To honor heaven is to obey heaven. And in the Chinese family, obedience is mandatory. In the cosmos, obedience is also mandatory. For the wise man must obey heaven, must in all things follow in every way that he can the way of heaven. And how shall he attain the knowledge of this way? And that is, must be, as always, through the ex example of his parents. The human man receives certain instruction through the example of his parents. All humanity, children of heaven and earth, are also instructed by the examples of heaven and earth. And the Chinese point out that among these examples are absolute justice, absolute law, eternal patience, and continual everlasting forgiveness. These are the way of heaven. Man may err, but heaven is great enough to accept the error of man without condemnation. Man may temporarily wander from home like the prodigal son, but heaven can wait. Heaven can wait until man returns. The individual may regard himself as far wiser than his father, knowing much more than heaven about everything. Heaven again can wait because man can change and find out the truth. But heaven has nothing to change, so it can simply wait. It can wait because in eternity there is no time. And whether it takes the man a year or a thousand lives to awaken, not either one is but an instant in eternity. So there is no hurry. There is only need for the perfect learning of the lesson. Now, in the same way that there are responsibilities of man to heaven, the family also reveals the responsibilities of heaven and earth to man. There are proprieties for parents also. And these proprieties cannot be violated in their turn. For all parenthood must be copied from the way of heaven. The imperial power of heaven is never impatient, never unjust, never partial, never revengeful. The imperial power of heaven has no favorites, it leaves out none, it condemns nothing, it criticizes nothing, it simply remains itself, and by so doing, ultimately draws all else unto itself. Heaven never has to apologize. Heaven never needs to be angry. For anger is a sign of weakness, and heaven is strong. 
Heaven never needs to defend itself, for heaven is never aware that it is weak in anything. Therefore, not needing to defend itself, it does not need to talk back, to argue. It does not need to strike down the unjust man with lightning. Nor does it need to take the beliefs of men and condemn them by a voice from the sky. Heaven does not interfere with the foolishness of men, because there is no need to. Heaven can wait. And by waiting, heaven fulfills its greatest duty. A man finally comes to heaven, coming to the presence of his father in a proper manner, respectfully. Coming also like the prodigal son returning to his father's house, aware of his own shortcomings, and very grateful when light does break that the father did not force light upon him. This quiet, inevitable control is the way of heaven. Heaven does not take part in elections. Heaven does not interfere with the conspiracies of men, because heaven knows that all conspiracies must lead in time to those experiences which will bring man back to heaven. Everything ends in reality, and heaven, being reality, accepts into itself everything that awakens to truth. So earth is a little stage on which actors walk about playing their varied parts, and everyone is audience to everyone else. The master of the show is heaven, and all the plays are little miracle productions, little sacred dramas, little fable stories, legends, myths, every one of them relating to the mysteries of heaven and earth. Every hero and every heroine is heaven and earth again, and every villain is the ignorance of the human mind. So these work out together, hero, heroine, villain, heaven, earth, and man. And it is up to man uh, to restore, restate his own true nature. In other words, he must one of these days be a reformed villain. Heaven in this sense, then, becomes in a, in a, a magnet. And as the Indian yoga, yogis know, man approaches heaven by being unlike everything except heaven. Man must come into some kind of relationship with heaven. This relationship can be internal, but having been established internally, it becomes eternal. So man, in his meditation, meditates, if he does so correctly, in terms of the Chinese proprieties. He comes simply and quietly as a son returning to his father's house. He realizes that it is his eternal birthright to go home, to be one with truth. He realizes that he is not asking some special favor. He is not an uncast, a para, who must beg for the privilege of being saved. He is by his eternal nature saved all. The only thing he is asking for is that he may have the insight to know that he is saved and how. Therefore he comes into the presence of the disciplines with perfect security of consciousness.
He knows that that which he desires is his birthright, that it was his before the beginning of the world, that all he is doing is asking respectfully as a son, whose birthright has been established, that he may receive that birthright. And in order to receive it, he must perform the proprieties. He must reestablish within himself the true relationship between man and heaven, the simple, natural, honorable relationship, a relationship that was probably better experienced by peasants and artisans and agriculturists and shopkeepers than by those who had the higher intellectual attainment. Those who could simply interpret the duty of the son to the father had the secrets of yoga. For these duties were duties kindly given from a deep affection. Man approaches deity because of a deep respect, regard, affection for reality. He finds himself yearning after righteousness. And as his na nature naturally unfolds, its kindness, its thoughtfulness, he knows when he must bow his head to the eternal. And he is one of these creatures that must achieve through acceptances. He cannot be manned. He cannot say that enlightenment is his by divine right. He can't say it for two reasons. First, because he cannot demand it. And the second place is uh, that it is his already, but not in the arrogant and aggressive way that he thinks. It is only by this quietude that he can break through the barrier of his own sophistication, his own mental arrogance. Zen tells us the same thing. Uh, Vedanta tells us the same thing. That acceptance mystically is to allow the experience of the infinite to move in upon our own consciousness. In this way, we share with earth the life of heaven. When in our own thinking, heaven moves us, we are one with heaven. So the uh, ancient Chinese mingling their thoughts with the early uh, Hindu Buddhists who came to China developed this idea of the individual being utterly and completely moved by the infinite moved by something he could not define, moved by the power that Lao Tzu tells us about, this way of heaven, Tao, moved by the eternal rhythm of the infinite. And this rhythm is the rhythm of eternal obedience, man being like the little ship floating upon the stream. The motion of the ship, the rocking of the ship, everything determined by the water. Man on the surface of the river of Tao floats along the way of heaven, the way of law, trusting entirely and completely in heaven itself. This is the perfect acceptance of meditation. This is the power that was referred to as the eighth step in the Mahaparanavana. For in it, Buddha approaching dissolution finally reached the state where he cast off even the power to cast off. Re renounced in himself the power to renounce and trusted himself completely on the or in the substance of a totally unconditioned state. This was the total acceptance.
This is undoubtedly the basis of the concept that he who loses his life for truth shall find it again. But he who tries to save his life will lose it. So heaven says, if you lose your life for my sake, you will have life everlasting. It is the acceptance which then permits the complete identification of the individual with the universal. His rebellion is the barrier between himself and truth. As this rebellion ceases in him, he becomes one with the truth that always was. The acceptance of heaven is the ultimate act of filial piety. It is the Son acknowledging the Father. And this is a dignified, ritualistic procedure in Chinese life. The Father would never think of humiliating his Son. He would never think of condemning his Son, no matter what might be in his heart or mind. He might find ways of subtly communicating in some way through a third person, perhaps, his grave anxieties about his son. But the father will not break the proprieties either. Heaven will never be less than heaven in order to please men. Heaven will never thunder to prove to man that heaven exists. Heaven will wait until man discovers the fact for himself. So out of this polarity of heaven and earth, which the ancients interpreted in so many ways, comes the concept of the great cosmic family, and also man's final course of decision. There are mystics who have also realized, by the way, that complete union with the earth is also complete union with heaven. Thus in yoga, there is not only Raja Yoga, or the path of princely union, but there is also Kama Yoga, the complete forgetting of self in the service of human need. The individual can either forget himself in meditation in the presence of God, or he can forget himself by complete absorption into the problem of human consciousness. He can achieve it by absolutely losing self in service. And this is where the Northern School of Buddhism developed its Bodhisattva concept. The grand notion being that man can never know God until he forgets himself. He can forget himself in meditation, or he can forget himself in complete dedication to the needs of others. In both cases, the barrier of self is reduced. And in this way, uh, the power of heaven is released or expressed through this life. Heaven manifests when self ceases to arbitrarily determine truth and error, so that the moment man forgets that he wants to be saved, he finds salvation. When in the search for salvation he desires only truth, and the unselfish loss of himself in eternity, he then also becomes a mystic. But whatever it is, man must accept heaven. And by whatever way he accepts heaven, either through consciousness or through dedication to duty, he achieves the end which he desires. And that is that he achieves in himself the reunion of earth and heaven. For ultimately, the earth as a power must go back to heaven. And all things earthy must return to their heavenly origin. The great deity must finally be reunited completely. And man, in his own achievement, 
foreshadows this ultimate union. And in so doing, probably fulfills most of the latent symbolism in this great polarized concept. Well, time is up, so I think we'll have to stop for this evening. <laughs>